The bad news is, this has happened to you before. I will push if I want to push! The good news is, it isn't your fault. I hate doors! This is Behavioral Science Toolkit, a series on behavioral science and its applications. When we use a door, the process is nearly automatic. As you approach, your brain has already decided which side the hinges are on, whether to push it, pull it, or slide it, and how much force is needed to move it. Almost every time, these expectations are correct, and we're through the door without a second thought. But sometimes our expectations don't align with reality, and the result is... Oh, looks like you push. Doors like this that go against our expectations, that lie to our unconscious minds about how to use them, have been nicknamed Norman Doors. Named after Don Norman, the author of this classic book on human-centered design, the design of everyday things. Norman describes a world full of objects that are constantly communicating to us through their design. The handle of a mug is the perfect fit for our fingers to say, hold me here, and the flat base of a chair is about the right size to say, sit on me. Norman doors betray this kind of communication. These are doors with horizontal bars that say, push me, but you're supposed to pull, or with vertical bars that say, pull me, but you're meant to push, or a glass door that doesn't say anything at all because it's invisible and you walk right into it. When an object communicates to us its function, what actions it makes possible, this is called an affordance. Just as you can easily see that a mug can be grasped and filled with liquid, it also affords the possibility of holding pencils or weighing down paper. You perceive these affordances due to the physical structure of the mug, but your past experience and memory play a large role in perceiving affordances as well. For example, having never encountered a can opener before, you'd likely be confused as to its purpose, though the design does offer some clues. You can tell that you should grasp the long end that looks like a handle, and the bit at the top looks like you can spin it. But clasping the two circular gears onto the top of a can, holding tightly, and spinning the top piece to open it would likely not spring to mind. But once you've been shown what it's used for and how to use it, this object clearly conveys the can opening affordance to you. Don Norman offers affordances as one of the principles of human-centered design which focuses on designing products to fit the physical and psychological needs of human beings by making it easy to understand what an object's purpose is and how to operate it. Often, the best way to do this is to look backward, to design objects, websites, services, or whatever with the user's past experiences in mind. When the first gas-powered automobiles entered the market, they looked almost identical to horse-drawn carriages just without the horses. This design effectively communicated what the machine was used for, where to sit, and where to store your luggage. The horseless carriage used a familiar design to increase customer and public comfort with and understanding of the new technology. This is the foundation of a design philosophy called skeuomorphism, which is also commonly used in our new digital world as well. Think of what you do to delete something off of your computer you drag it into the trash can. And how do you gather and organize documents and other information? You put them all into a common folder. These are effective metaphors reflecting the old, real world that easily and quickly convey their function to users. While our understanding of an object is greatly informed by our past experiences, the present context in which an object is presented can also change how we perceive it. To demonstrate this, let's do a little test of creativity called the candle problem. Pause the video when you see this symbol if you'd like a chance to think. You are taken to a room and are given a matchbook, a box of tacks, and a candle. Can you use these objects to fix a lit candle to the wall without the wax falling on the table below? Perhaps you thought to try sticking some tacks through the candle and into the wall, but the tacks are too small and the wax strips. Now let's say you're given the same task, but this time you're handed a matchbook, an empty box, a handful of tacks, and a candle. What's your solution now? It's now far easier to see the option of attaching the box to the wall with the tacks and placing the candle on top, even though in both scenarios you were given the same tools. When the tacks are presented inside the box, it's 
easy to see the box is simply a container for the tax. But once the box is physically and therefore conceptually separated from the tax, its independent affordances are made clearer and the solution presents itself. We tend to continue to use objects in the same ways that they're currently being used or in ways that are similar to how we've used them before, instead of thinking outside the box. This is termed functional fixedness. But this bias toward the fixed and the familiar should not be seen as a flaw to be corrected with labels and instructions, as so many Normandors like to do. A good designer doesn't blame the user for lack of understanding, but recognizes that an effective and useful design communicates its purpose by respecting its user's past experiences, offering clear affordances, and understanding the context in which the object will be presented. So it isn't your fault that you can't open a Normandor, it's the design. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to see more content on human such a design, just let me know in the comments below. See you next time.